I'm Matt Martin sitting in with me is Matt Crow. And we have uh, we have Scott Braddock, editor of the Quorum Report on line one. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm well. Good morning, Matt Squared. Yeah, it's a Matt and Matt show today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Scott, um, now one of the things that I wanted to start out talking to you about, just uh, it, it probably caused a little controversy, but I don't care. Here we go. Uh, uh, I love it. I, I must be on the radio with Matt Martin. <laughs> if we're going to mess it up. Let's go. Uh, so, uh, Representative Stickland, yep. uh, now he's in a district that seems to be coming more and more moderate. Um, but he's fairly uh, he's fairly right. I mean, he's pretty strongly he right. Would say that. He um, would say that. I would say he's a libertarian, um, and those aren't exactly the same. But but yeah, you're on track. So he's decided not to run again. Do you think that he is for being forced out, or do you think he's uh, just decided not to run? Well, there's the reality of his district changing, like you said. I mean, he finished with 49% on election night in 2018, and as the story goes, he went to bed that night not knowing if he would wake up the next morning and the returns would hold and he would actually be coming back to Austin. Now, he says he hates Austin, so since he hates it so much, I thought he would sleep like a baby because, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, he would maybe have he's to not going to have to come back down here and see us anymore. Uh, by the way, I've always had a good relationship with Jonathan. But, uh, yeah, he's somebody who, um, you know, is a, a straight shooter. He's somebody who you know exactly where he stands. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm never against somebody who's going to be honest. Yeah, and, and when he made his announcement, I take it in good faith that he, uh, you know, looked at it and said, hey, um, you know, I'm moving on to other things, and it does make sense given those numbers. Now, here's a question that I do have and has not been answered and I think may be answered in the months to come, uh, is whether or not groups that have supported him financially also looked at those numbers and said, you know what, we can't win in this area anymore, so maybe we need to pull the plug on funding. Uh, you know, I mean, Empower Texans, for example, has given him hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years to run for state representative, and they also saw those numbers, 49%, and maybe said, you know what, we can't win there, so maybe we'll make our investment elsewhere. Or it might mean that, hey, if they're not going to fund him anymore, because he was their marquee guy in Austin, yeah. you know, one of their top beneficiaries and one of the guys who always sort of carried the torch for everything that uh, Empower Texans and the Midland Mafia, as I like to say, uh, everything that they are all about, uh, you know, he, he's the guy uh, who Tim Dunn, the head of Empower Texans, he, he's the only representative that I know of that Tim Dunn actually went to the district and gave a speech at a fundraiser, you know, trying to raise money for uh, that state representative. So they're very personally invested in him. So I wonder if going forward, you know, if they're going to be investing in other candidates, if they're not even going to, you know, write checks for him anymore. So speaking of Empower Texas, uh, Mm -hmm. Stickland was on the Chad Hasty program Tuesday, said that uh, Empower Texas has massive, now this is the term I got from Chad, massive influence in texas it seems like to me it's kind of the opposite like their their influence is waning some what are your thoughts on empower texas moving forward i think when we see um the campaign finance reports uh you know coming out uh, in the middle of this year uh and going forward we'll know better the answer to that question you know whether or not they're going to continue to uh fund candidates in primaries against sitting republican state representatives and let's be clear uh empower texans their their business is um, you know, influencing the Republican Party and playing in Republican Party politics. You don't see them attacking Democrats very much, not really going after liberals. I mean, they might say, you know, that they're against liberalism and they might attack, uh, you know, Democrats uh, with their rhetoric, uh, but the money they spend is generally almost always against uh, sitting Republican. Right, they're the trying to get rid of uh, moderate right. Republicans. What they for call the rhinos or moderates, ones, you're right. right. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what their level of influence is going to be. I can tell you that during the legislative session, uh, their influence seemed to be uh, waning for sure. Uh, they seem to be more like uh, protesters than anybody who was in Austin doing any governing. Yeah. All right, uh, so one thing that happened last night, and the night well, actually the night before, so we saw a couple of Texans up in the Democrat debate. How do you think they yep. did? You know, I think uh, Julian Castro shocked a lot of people uh, just with the fact that he was so aggressive in going after former Congressman Beto O'Rourke. Um, I wasn't shocked to just from the standpoint of uh, here's two guys who are trying to be the Texas candidate. Either one of them would like for that to be the case. Um, and I think uh, Castro came out, you know, ready uh, to, you know, sort of swing for the fences and go after Beto. Uh, and Beto just did not cast a shadow. I mean, I, for us in Texas, we're kind of laughing and chuckling about the fact that Beto did not do well, which I think just objectively he didn't do well at all. Um, I saw that Castro's um, Google searches, and this is always, you know, one of the quick indicators after these debates. So how many people 
had not heard of this person before, and now they want more information. Castro's Google searches had gone up, uh, you know, in the 12 hours after the debate, something something crazy like 2,400 percent, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so people trying to find out about him. And remember, you know, with 20 people on stage, uh, you know, 10 people each night, there are so many folks on that stage that, you know, maybe in their home states, of course, people know who they are, like Castro and like O'Rourke for us in Texas. But there are so many people around the country who have still never even heard of those guys. And, you know, for a lot of those, uh, last night they had some uh, lady who uh, is an author who I'd oh, never heard of. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Williams. Mary Ann Williams. Uh, you know, she was loopy. I, I follow politics for a living, and I never heard of this woman. Uh, so how many average <laughs> voters uh, out there are going, who is this person? You know, the congressman from Connecticut or Delaware or whatever, uh, uh, Delaney. People were asking, who in the world is this? Uh, yeah, one, you know, time, the, one thing I saw on Twitter uh, over and over was, how did she end up on the stage with these guys? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, the DNC, uh, they're trying to manage this thing in a way that makes some sort of sense. Uh, look, when you've got that many candidates running for president, uh, there's going to be some criticism about the way it gets handled by both the political party and by the uh, sponsoring network, NBC News, that was putting on the debate. Uh, there's no way to do it where it's not messy uh, when you have that many people vying for attention. Uh, and when you're one of these candidates, the trick is you've got to grab people's attention and keep it. And you saw that some of the candidates were sort of demanding attention, like that Congressman Delaney who kept you know, sort of uh, you know, complaining that the moderators weren't going to him enough. Uh, well, you know, complaining about not, and get, not getting attention doesn't really go over well with people. You well, just gotta, they were, be compelling. Be compelling. Well, I was going to say, and on top of that, you had them jumping in and, and demanding attention, like Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. and, and the moderators were backing down every single time. I mean, it was a terrible debate, honestly, as far as moderation was concerned. They did a terrible job of, of keeping candidates within the perimeters, but if you're a candidate, that's great. You can just jump in and make a fool of yourself and are, are, are a big stink, and you were on the stage. Everybody was watching you. Well, let me, uh, let me disagree just a little bit. All right. uh, and by the way, I was not thrilled with the moderating either, but for a different reason. Um, you know, they were sort of selectively enforcing those rules. I right, because Kamala uh, yeah, Harris did whatever she wanted. Point. Yeah, she kind of jumped in there and, and did whatever whatever she would like. I mean, that, you don't really. It, it's not wise to get in the, in the way of a former prosecutor when she's speaking, <laughs> though. Um, uh, look, uh, those rules are really for the candidates. You know, th those rules are there because the candidates all want to be heard, and they're they're looking for some sort of equal time. Uh, but for the audience, they want to hear where these people stand. They don't really care. You know, most people in the audience don't really care what the rules are, and they're not sitting there with a stopwatch saying, oh, this person got that much time and that person got that much time. They want to hear where these people stand on the issues. And I think, um, in some respects, you do want to kind of pull back and allow for those folks to have a dialogue up there because what voters want to do is kick the tires on these candidates and figure out who's the most durable. Hey, Scott, changing gears for a second. Yes, uh, hey, Matt. Good morning. Uh, former Speaker Joe Strauss has yeah. announced he's going to uh, fund a, a new uh, political action committee, uh, committee rather called Texas Forever Forward. What's, what's your take on, on the whys and wherefores of that? You know, a lot of folks have been chattering about what Strauss would do with the money in the bank. I think he started the year with $8 million in his campaign account, and you do uh, end up – uh, you know, gathering quite a bit of campaign cash when you're the Speaker of the House. I think Dennis Bonin came into the year with about $5 million, something like that. And, uh, look, when uh, Bonin was just a rank-and-file, uh, you know, person in the House, uh, you know, as a chairman, well, a little more than rank-and-file, but as a chairman, I think he had about 700000 something like that in his account uh, last year. As soon as it was clear he would be Speaker, the Austin lobby and others put about $5 million in his account. That's, that's how powerful the speaker's position is you know people people want to have that influence um he put uh, strauss put 2.5 million uh, into this new effort he says he's going to use uh, his campaign cash to promote quote a thoughtful conservative approach to governing and rising political leaders ready to ensure a bright future for all texans unquote this comes after we had heard a quorum report uh, for months uh, that Strauss has been sort of informally talking to candidates, you know, for various offices, be that, you know, state senate or state house or whatever, uh, you know, various uh, various offices that people might run for. He's trying to figure out who he might want to support with this deal. Uh, one question is going to be whether he can raise any more money, and I can tell you that, it, you know, in politics, as soon as you say you're not running anymore, and it doesn't even, it's, it's not when you're actually out of office, but it's as soon as you say you're not running anymore. Wait, remember, he announced his retirement well before that. Uh, well, then, uh, you know, the big contributors, they, they just don't care anymore, and it's nothing personal. Yeah, just ask it's, Hillary it's, Clinton. Well, it's, it's nothing personal. It's just that when you're not running anymore, uh, you know, making big uh, contributions to a politician, 
that's an investment. It, you know, it, you expect them, the politician, to be doing something with that money. And so, um, you know, we'll see where Strauss goes with this. He's, uh, as I said, he put uh, $2.5 million into this effort. Overall, uh, that still leaves him with roughly about $8 million in the bank between his various accounts. Uh, and there was some chatter after this news came out earlier in the week uh, that, you know, Strauss is not closing the door to maybe running for something else, uh, you know, later, maybe something statewide in 2022. Of course, that would, uh, you know, have to factor in a calculation of whether or not uh, other people uh, like Governor Abbott or Lieutenant Governor Patrick, maybe some of those people might not be uh, running for re-election, uh, you know, if Strauss wanted to run for one of those offices, for example. Of course, they say that they are running again, at least I know, uh, the lieutenant governor has said strongly that he's running for re-election. And, uh, of course, as I said, they have to say that, you know, because they don't want to be lame ducks. So we're, we're talking with uh, editor of the Quorum Report, Scott Braddock. Uh, Scott, what do you all have on the Quorum Report right now? Well, we're you know looking into a couple of the different things that are happening at the national level that do inform Texas politics. There was a huge ruling yesterday, a two, a two rulings, I think, that really impact Texas. Uh, you know, one, uh, and you probably talked about it this morning, I believe I heard about it during your news update there from Michael Board earlier about uh, the uh, census question uh, about uh, mm-hmm. citizenship and uh, whether or not the census is going to ask people, whether they're citizens, uh, you know, whether, whatever you think of the issue, it has huge impact for Texas uh, because we do have a large undocumented population. Of course, the Constitution refers to people who live in certain areas and not necessarily citizens. And so, of course, that has to do with how many members of Congress we get, uh, you know, in the 2021 uh, cycle and, uh, and also how much in federal funding uh, we get for various uh, things back here in Texas. Of course, as your listeners probably know, we are a donor state. Uh, when it comes to uh, big things, you know, we're we send more in taxes to Washington than we get back right. uh, in Texas. And it like uh, eighty, economy. we only get like eighty-four percent or something back. Yeah, it's 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 paltry compared to what some other states get. Yeah. There's other states where they don't send nearly as much as they actually get back. It were right. flipped uh, in that regard. And then the other thing is, uh, the Supreme Court said that they're not going to get involved in partisan gerrymandering, the way that uh, power is allocated and uh, uh, political districts are drawn. We're breaking all that down for folks at quorumreport.com. All right. Well, Scott, thank you for calling in. We'll talk to you next Friday. Well, I guess we won't talk to you next Friday. We'll talk to you the Friday after because uh, we'll be gone next Friday. Uh, enjoy the vacation. All right, you talk too. to you, Matt and Matt. All right. Thanks, Scott. See you. Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye. We'll be right back after these messages.